Thank you, thank you. <laughs> we're very time compressed today. Uh, I've got an hour and a half talk for you, but we're gonna just go through about 30 minutes of it. The bottom line is ICD-10 is coming October the 1st, uh, and it's not gonna be delayed any longer, and, but we wanna get to some uh, high clinical points to talk about uh, why this is important to us. We're being graded for cost efficiency and quality of care. They're not looking at your charts, they're getting that information from the billing records and judging the, the number of ICD-9 codes and the severity assigned to those codes by relative weight. And not every diagnosis has the same amount of relative weight assigned to it. So we're gonna talk about some clinical issues that are important to cardiology that are important in these translations. Uh, just a couple of minutes on the, the translation of our medical language that we use with each other and on the medical record and how that's translated into the administrative languages for billing, reimbursement, statistical analysis, quality analysis, and cost efficiency analysis. These are the three main methodologies used for this. The first two, the MSDRGs and APRDRGs are for inpatients. Uh, Medicare and the privates use MSDRGs. APRDRGs are used by Medi-Cal. Uh, the HCC hierarchical condition categories, those codes derive from outpatient diagnoses as well as inpatient diagnoses, and those are very important uh, because they're used to judge us by quality and cost, efficient, cost efficiency of care, and that's the methodology used to fund accountable care organizations, Medicare Advantage uh, organizations, and, and the, the like. Now, within the MSDRG system, there's a three-tiered assignment of declaration of the severity of, a, of an illness within a condition. Uh, there are MCCs, which are major comorbidities or complications, CCs, which are not major comorbidities or complications, and the third tier is neither one of those. We get no credit for things that are in that bottom tier. For example, this is a table that uh, identifies the three levels of severity within a condition. Uh, we're talking about heart failure here, uh, not a CC, no increased relative weight, CC, modest increased relative weight, and major increased relative weight. Now, years ago, when I was training and somebody had an exacerbation of heart failure, the, the, the diagnosis was just CHF. Everybody knew they had heart failure, it got worse, they had to be in the hospital, and, and everybody understood that. The current system of coding makes no such assumptions. So when we just use the word heart failure, we get no credit for it, none, zero. Uh, if we add functionality, systolic, diastolic, or combined, we get some increased relative weight, but the coding system says, well, they had heart failure last week, they weren't in the hospital, what's different? Well, what's different is they had an acute exacerbation of systolic, diastolic, or combined heart failure. So to get credit, this is the term that we have to use. When we use the term acute systolic heart failure, the relative weight is much higher. So what the hospital spends to accomplish the care, the, the amount of money we spend on drugs, the number of days in the hospital, physician care, nursing care, it is what it is. But the sicker the patient looks on paper, the better we look in, in, in caring for the patient in terms of our quality assessment and cost efficiency assessment. It never used to make any difference. It makes a big difference now. We're gonna see how dramatic these number changes are. Now, we can use terms like, you know, the New York Heart Association classification, the Killip classification, to communicate with each other. We get no credit for any of those. And I understand the cardiology literature prefers the term, you know, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. We get no credit for that. We, we, we got to use this. We can use those other things to communicate with each other, but to get credit for the patient's severity of illness, we just got to use that. In my practice experience, these were two of my favorite words to, to document in emergency medicine for more than a quarter century, altered mental status and unresponsive. I had no idea I was getting no credit for those terms. But a mental status is like a nose. Everybody's got one. Altered nose is not a diagnosis. Neither is altered mental status. It gives you no clue what's causing the alteration. But if it's a delirium, if we can categorize it as a delirium or a psychosis, we get increased rate for that. If they have an altered mental status because their sodium is 110, they have a delirium that's due to a metabolic encephalopathy. We get huge relative weight credit for that. This is uh, the HCC methodology. We're gonna spend a moment about this. this is, the table looks kind of busy, but this is about one patient, 65-year-old female. She has 
breast cancer, metastases to bone, she's malnourished and has pressure ulcers. Uh, and you'll notice it's based on calendar year codes because the HCC codes expire at the end of every calendar year. They have to be renewed. They did that to create the incentive for somebody, some physician, to see this patient at least once every year. If that does not happen, we just get what's attributed to her baseline demographic, which is a relative weight of 0.3 and change, and you multiply that by the base rate, which is in the neighborhood of $10,000, so we get, we get $3,000 to care for her next year. But when we see her and we categorize all of the things going on with her, then we accumulate these relative weights. The fact that she has breast cancer is three times her, her baseline relative weight. That it has metastases to bone doubles it yet again. The malnourishment has this level of added relative weight. And all of these add up uh, to a total risk adjustment factor when we accumulate everything of almost six. So we have almost $60,000 to care for her next year. So when she comes into the hospital and has her acute MI <clears throat> and you're dipping your, your ladle into the bucket for reimbursement, you want to be in this deep bucket over here. Now you notice that history of breast cancer has no relative weight assigned to it at all and that has to do with the ambiguity of the term history of in our practice. When we use the term history of uh, heart failure or history of diabetes or history of hypertension, we're communicating the fact that they have those things now. But the, the coding system says when, when they see the term history of, it means, yes, the patient had it, but they do not have it any longer, and we're doing absolutely nothing to treat it. So we need to have caution, particularly when we use electronic health records that have you know, scroll downs under the history of category, history of hypertension, history of diabetes, history of lupus. We may think we're populating a problem list when all we're doing is telling the world they don't have this, they don't have that, they don't have the other thing. So the, the phrase history of, we need to be cautious of. Now, in the HCC system, again, very important because that's the me methodology they're using to grade us, they have codes uh, for about 70 different things. There are about 70,000 ICD-10 codes. There are only about 70 HCC codes. Not everything has a code. It gets funneled down very nicely. The things that are short-term, uh, low acuity, that don't have a high likelihood of, of activity during the course of the year, they might not even have a code. Atherosclerotic heart disease without angina has no HCC code. But if they have any form of angina, there is a code for that. So if we have a patient on long-term nitrate therapy, nitrodur, mdur, nitro paste, why are we doing that? Why do we put somebody on chronic nitrate? One of the reasons is if they have recurring angina and are dropping a lot of sublingual nitros, we put them on a long-acting nitrate to reduce the incidence of angina, we're treating angina. So if they're on chronic nitrates, we're treating angina, even though they're not symptomatic of angina. And that may seem a little counterintuitive, but if I have diabetes and I'm taking gliburide and my blood sugar is normal, my hemoglobin A1C is normal, do I have diabetes? Sure. If I have hypertension, and I'm taking an antihypertensive, and my blood pressure is normal, my LV size, structure, and function is normal, do I still have hypertension? I do. Uh, and, and if I'm on chronic nitrates because I have breakthrough angina when I don't, we're treating angina. So we want to give ourselves credit for that. And there's a whole list of these. I would invite you to think about when you're looking at the patient's medication list, identify the condition that we're treating with that. Uh, because that condition may not obviously be on your mind, but the longer we make that list of ICD-9 codes, and after October, ICD-10, that attributes to the complexity of our patient, all, and we're accounting for all of this in our mind, but now we have to list all these things to get credit for it because we're getting graded for quality and cost efficiency. So it's obvious if, uh, if somebody has diabetes, you know, when we're taking an anti-glycemic, if we're taking an antihypertensive, we're treat, treating hypertension. If we're taking a, a seizure medication, we're treating a seizure disorder. But it's not so obvious, you know, when we're using uh, long-term uh, nitrates to treat angina. If somebody comes in uh, with an atrial fibrillation and we put them on amiodarone, then, then we're treating atrial fibrillation with amiodarone. If they convert to normal sinus rhythm, how, how long do we typically keep them on the, on the antidysrhythmic? Do we stop it immediately or continue it for 
six months or something? Okay. So even though they're back in sinus rhythm, they're on that medication treating atrial fibrillation even though they don't, even though they're in normal sinus rhythm. And in ICD-10, this doesn't apply in nine, but after October, uh, persistent atrial fibrillation is a secondary diagnosis at that middle level of a CC. All the other forms of atrial fibrillation, we don't get increased relative weight for. Uh, for paroxysmal, by definition, lasts than, less than a week. Uh, so it's here, it's gone. It's not resource intensive enough to get increased relative weight. If somebody has permanent atrial fibrillation, and we've given up trying to cardiovert them back into normal sinus rhythm, we're just anticoagulating them, controlling their rate. We get no increased relative weight for permanent atrial fibrillation, but when we're st still trying to manipulate the rhythm in persistent atrial fibrillation, then there is increased relative weight for that. But we have to call it persistent atrial fibrillation to get that credit. The coders can code from the progress notes or the discharge okay. note or your consult note. Okay. What, what we like to see them, just to establish clinical validity, mm -hmm. so the review audit contractors don't say, well, you mentioned that one time and it, not again, and so we're not gonna allow that. Uh, they make their money taking money away from the hospitals. Uh, if you can mention it um, you know, more than one time, that's helpful. Uh, certainly, the most important document is the discharge summary, but I understand many times you're the consultant, not the admitter or discharger. Uh, so if, if you could uh, establish a couple of times, if somebody's on a cardiac medication, just note the condition you're treating with that, even though the manifestations of that condition may not be apparent to the, the, the casual reviewer or, or even us because we're just not tuned to think in that way. We see somebody on MDUR, you know, you don't even think twice. Uh, they're not having an engine. That's great. That's why they're on the drug. This is applicable in the outpatient setting too because these HCC codes are, are diagnoses uh, that, uh, you know, ICD-9 codes that accumulate from both outpatient and the inpatient environment. And in some instances, this is like the umpire calling balls and strikes in baseball. They'll tell you it's not anything until I say what it is, and then that's what it is. We still get to diagnose conditions. It has to be clinically relevant. It has to be clinically defensible. It has to be logical, but we, we're, we still get to make the diagnosis. And another thing with uh, HIV disease, uh, that's just become another chronic manageable disease. I know you guys don't see all, a lot of it now, but as long as somebody is on antiretroviral therapy, if they have ever in their life had an AIDS-defining illness or an AIDS-defining CD4 count, as long as they're on retrovirals, which will, will be forever, uh, then they have the diagnosis of AIDS. They may be normal weight, they may be healthy as a horse, they're gonna live a long life and die of something else, but for purposes of diagnosis and coding, they still have that because we're still treating it. So what if somebody comes in in atrial fibrillation, uh, their first episode, and we start them on amiodarone, and persistent by definition is AFib that lasts longer than seven days. So let's say we put them on amiodarone and they can revert to normal sinus rhythm on hospital day three. We're short of the seven days. Uh, we're gonna send them home on the amiodarone and we're gonna continue that longer than the seven days, which takes us into the persistent time frame. Can we diagnose them as having persistent atrial fibrillation when they're discharged on hospital day four, even though it's been less than a week? I don't have the answer to that. I'm just asking the question. If we intend to treat them beyond that seven day threshold, going from paroxysmal to persistent, and we're using the medication treating that condition, can we draw the line at hospital day four? I, I don't know the answer to that. I think you probably could justify it, but, uh, and I think you could defend it, but I, I don't know what the, uh, I've never seen that challenged before. Food for thought. That's why this is so much fun. I do not know the difference between typical and atypical flutter. I hope you do. So you're going to have uh, available to you tables of, of words that we use that for which we get no credit, words for which we get a little increased credit, and words for which we get a great increased credit. If somebody comes in in rapid atrial fibrillation and are having an episode of heart failure due to the speed at which the ventricle is contracting and it's not spending enough time in diastole to fill, then that might be diastolic heart failure, acute diastolic heart failure, and we get big credit for that. 
So we're being challenged to think about uh, you know, what we're seeing and what we're doing in terms of what we actually, you know, what they're giving us credit for and what they don't. Sometimes it's not obvious what it is. And then you can call the ball and strike and just say, combine. In ICD-10, there are codes for uh, MIs by uh, ST elevation or uh, non-STEMI by regional identification. And then when you cast somebody, you can identify the actual vessel that's going on. So in ICD-10, they're classified by STEMI or non-STEMI region and vascular anatomy, but the cardiology literature classifies them as types 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. The coding system really doesn't uh, uh, do it that way. And then the third universal definition of MI has to be you know, symptoms of ischemia and a rise and fall in the troponin. Do we use the term troponin leak still? Yeah, they're, they're, this is driving them crazy at Vanderbilt. They still don't know how to, how to do this. Uh, or, or, or how to categorize these. The type 1s are obvious, we all understand those. Uh, the type 2s are uh, usually associated with conditions where the myocardial oxygen demand exceeds the supply. And then there's this issue of non-ischemic myocardial injury with necrosis. But I liken these type 2 MIs to a snake that can sneak up and bite you because there's something else that's got your attention. They may be in, in shock for some reason or other, anemic, respiratory failure. If troponin rises, then if the, if the setting is ischemic, that classifies as a type 2 MI. One of my dog walk, my dog park buddy, Vanderbilt electrophysiologist, and she said, we had a 35-year-old female that came in in SVT. We don't know how long she was in SVT, but we checked her troponins, and they were bumped. So they cast her stone-cold normal coronary arteries. Well, they didn't want to classify this 35-year-old woman with normal coronary arteries as having had an acute MI, but, but the, the, they'll, they'll just write down you know, in the note, troponin elevation consistent with type 2 MI, and then the coders will code a type 2 MI, and they'll see the coding and somebody, why did you say this patient had an MI? They didn't have an MI. Well, doctor, that's what you wrote down. We just coded what you wrote down. So, so uh, it, it revolves around whether you think it's ischemic or not. And there's, there's some things that can cause a troponin leak that obviously are not ischemic. You know, if there's trauma, surgery, ablation, defibrillator shocks, rhabdo, myocarditis, uh, drugs and chemicals that damage the heart muscle. And these last two I struggle a little bit with, uh, sepsis, severe sepsis. If it's not in the setting of septic shock, maybe if there's an endotoxin that, that may damage the heart muscle and acute pulmonary embolus if there's right heart strain. The term troponin leak has become the fibromyalgia of cardiology. You know, when you don't know what to call it, you just call it a troponin leak and hope nobody asks. But, uh, but I, after giving some thought about this, I, it's just whether you think there's ischemia involved or not. If there's no ischemia, then you call it non-ischemic myocardial injury, so you avoid mislabeling people with type 2 MIs. So when the troponin goes up in heart failure, it's, it's established that the mortality goes up with that too. In ICD-10, if we don't say it's a non-STEMI, every MI defaults to a, a ST elevation MI. So if it's not, we need to, to note that it's a non-STEMI. And if somebody has an acute MI and has a second MI within the next 28 days, the coders will code both MIs. You still get credit for the first one, even though they've gone home and come back, even if, if it's the, at the, you know, another infarct at the same anatomic location, same vessel, or a different vessel, you get credit for both of them. So if somebody's had a previous MI, it's important to know whether it's in the, that four-week window. The second MI in the coding world is called a subsequent MI to distinguish it from the first one. They will still code the first one as an acute MI, and then they will code a second MI as, as a subsequent MI, which increases the relative weight for the package. This is a mnemonic that my, my partner created. We're from Nashville, it's music, easy for us to remember. M stands for manifestations, the presenting sign symptom syndromes, U, underlying cause, S, it causes us to pause and consider the severity, specificity, uh, I, instigating or precipitating factors, C, consequences or complications. And when we identify a condition, we can plug it in here and then ponder these other things. And if we can link condition and cause, condition and consequence, a lot of times that increases, well, actually most of the time that increases the relative weight. And here's the value of just heart failure as a secondary diagnosis. This is just a simple pneumonia. And we're talking about heart failure, not an exacerbation, just the fact that they have heart failure. It causes us, you know, some, some intellectual energy to, to 
pay more attention to volume status and the like. We don't want to send them into exacerbation. So when we document the fact that they have, not history of, but that they have systolic or diastolic heart failure, it gives us a secondary diagnosis. So the relative weight goes up from 0.7 to 0.9. And even if you're just consulted on this patient that a hospitalist has in the hospital, this increased relative weight accrues to you as well. And with that come increased expected days of hospitalization. So by raising the severity level, by identifying these secondary diagnoses, it takes the heat off the urge to get them out of the hospital uh, faster. Chronic respiratory failure, when people come to the hospital with their oxygen canister and their bionasal canyon, uh, for Medicare to pay for home oxygen, there has to be some blood gas test out there that demonstrates they're hypoxic on room air. So we can diagnose chronic respiratory failure based on remote blood gas analysis. I don't care what the number is. I don't care when it was done. But for Medicare to pay for that, I know they had to have that so we can lock that diagnosis down. So systolic less than 40% ejection fraction, diastolic greater than 40. We can use terms like New York Heart Association classification, Killip classification. We don't get any increased extra credit for that because they all code out as heart failure not otherwise specified. So we have to use the term acute chronic or acute unchronic, systolic, diastolic, or combined. And then we can add whatever else we want to to communicate uh, with, with each other. Uh, but uh, for us to get credit in the system and to look good on paper, then, then we need to, to use uh, those terms. This is just a clinical example, and then we'll finish with this topic. Exacerbated heart failure, classic symptoms, the creatinine is up, troponin's up, lactate's up, EKG changes, pulmonary edema. So admitting diagnosis, decompensated heart failure, pre-renal azotemia, hypotension, lactatemia, and there are favorite friend, troponin leak. But let's go through each of these conditions and see what we can do with them. Uh, it, this is not just a simple heart failure patient, bring them in, diurese them, uh, and send them home in the morning. The rise of creatinine greater than 0.5 from the baseline, uh, the increase in troponins, EKG changes, we can explain the rise in creatinine by acute renal injury. You only have to have an increase in creatinine of 0.3 to diagnose acute renal injury. And in the setting of, of ischemia, in the setting of hypotension, uh, uh, shock, uh, uh, contrast-induced acute renal injury, all those are caused by acute tubular necrosis. When we can say AKI due to ATN, that puts it, that takes it from that middle level of credit for a secondary diagnosis of a CC, when we can add the AT, due to ATN, that jacks it up to, to that MCC level of the highest uh, level of credit. Demand ischemia explains the, the troponin rise in EKG, but in the setting of ischemia, the troponin rise is actually acute non-ST elevation in MI. And the fact that their uh, lactate level is above four means that we can diagnose cardiogenic shock. So we get much higher relative weight for cardiogenic shock in the setting of an acute non-ST elevation in MI, acute renal failure due to ATN and acute systolic heart failure. Now, Sometimes we're not sure what's going on yet. Sometimes patients are discharged, you know, they may have a DVT or a PE, and we do all that whole panel of, of uh, you know, lupus factor, laden factor, all that stuff I couldn't explain to you anymore. Uh, and the tests aren't back yet, uh, but there may be a hypercoagulable state still to be ruled out. If we use a qualifying diagnosis, probable, suspected, likely, and declare that at the time of discharge in inpatients, this doesn't help us in the office, doesn't help me in the ER, but for people in inpatient status, we can use qualified diagnoses and the coders can code it as if it were established in fact. So when we put somebody on an anticoagulant for a PE, we're not treating the clot because unless we give a thrombolytic, we're treating the hypercoagulable state. And, and hypercoagulable state is a secondary diagnosis at the level of a CC. Readmission penalties. For the past three years, they looked at heart failure, MI, pneumonia. Two of those three are in our neighborhood. This year, they're adding COPD and joint replacements. Now, these are the categories of ICD-9 codes that they take into consideration to review for heart failure readmission penalties. Ignore those, look at this. If a patient is a diagnosed with acute respiratory failure or an acute MI, they are taken out of that bucket for examination for readmission penalties. So if somebody comes in in acute heart failure and they bump their troponins, compared to the average heart failure patient, 
are they more likely to die or less likely to die than the average heart failure patient? They're more likely to die. Are they more likely or less likely to be admitted than the average heart failure patient? They're probably more likely to be readmitted. If we can get them out of that bucket, that will help our heart failure stat. Now, if this heart failure patient has a bump in their troponins, compared to acute MI patients, is their mortality, and I don't know the answer to this, I'm asking, is their mortality higher or lower, would you think, than the average acute MI patient? Would somebody, would somebody with a big ST elevation MI, would their more like, would mortality rate likely be higher than the heart failure patient who just bumps? So, so by, by taking them out of the heart failure bucket and putting them into the MI bucket, we might be helping the stat in both categories. If the patient's heart failure is due to a non-ischemic etiology, say a cancer chemotherapeutic agent has given them heart failure, then we may not be able to use this strategy. So it goes back to our discussion of the, the troponin leaks. The first thing you have to decide is, this is, is this ischemic or not? Now, let me ask you this, and again, I, I humbly don't know the answer to the question. Are there instances of heart failure where the heart muscle is weak because of a non-ischemic you know, etiology that would raise the BNP just because of the heart muscle strain? And, and, and I ask that, you know, I, I practiced at the Army Hospital at Fort Campbell taking care of the 101st Airborne, and they'd go out with, you know, 60 pounds on their back and march 15 miles, and, and we'd see all sorts of, you know, their CKs would be through the roof, and we'd have to admit them to hydrate them so they didn't clog up their kidneys. So I, I know that, that muscle strain can leak out all sorts of stuff. Uh, so if the heart muscle is strained, that may be a reason for a troponin leak that's not ischemic. There's a cascade, a domino effect of other things that when we declare a non-ST elevation MI, there are things that are expected to happen, like the aspirin and the beta blocker and the ACE inhibitors and all that sort of, so it's, it's, not, it's not an easy, you know, let's do this every time. There are, there are a, lot of things, a lot of things to consider. But when we can do it logically and legitimately with all those things in, in consideration, you know, the hospital's no longer at risk for the heart, heart failure readmission or mortality uh, penalties, and we as physicians get that increased relative weight from the, the higher weighted diagnosis. These are some Southern California hospitals, the names of whom have been concealed to protect the innocent. Observed versus expected heart failure mortality. This hospital's observed mortality is much less than they're expected. This hospital's observed mortality is higher than they're expected. I don't know if you can judge the quality of care here either way. It may have more to do with what category they put their patients in. In ICD-10, there are codes for documenting noncompliance. Now, you have always been able to protect yourself medical legally by documenting in the record noncompliance, but in ICD-9, there's no code for that. So, so you have to wait until the litigation, you know, to say, well, I wrote this down right here. The, the, the world had no way of knowing that uh, statistical analysis. Now in ICD-10, they will. Uh, so, so they will be able to, to take the cohort of patients, all of whom are noncompliant, and compare them to the patients that are compliant to see, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to know that there wasn't any difference in mortality? And all of these statistical analyses are risk adjusted. We don't get penalized for every readmission. We get penalized for an excessive rate of readmission compared to other hospitals and compared to other patients that are as sick as ours. So if our patients are this sick, and on paper they look this sick, we're going to get compared to other patients that are this sick. But the doctors that figure this out first are the ones that are going to look the best because they'll have all of this stuff written down. Their patients, their, their documentation will actually reflect the true complexity of their patient's severity of illness and then their readmissions you know, and mortality will be compared to, to, to other patients. If we document morbid obesity, we're going to get compared to other patients that are morbidly obese. That it's all graded on a curve. When we, when every time you say here or read something that's risk-adjusted analysis, it's just graded on a curve. We're comparing apples to apples, not apples to Krispy Kreme donuts. Wish I hadn't mentioned that. I love Krispy Kreme donuts. Thank you. I greatly appreciate your time, and we're gonna we're gonna get through this. We're gonna not just survive but thrive.